I'm going to be uh, hopping around the Bible again tonight, starting in uh, looking at several passages, but we'll be starting in Matthew 16 and uh, 1 Timothy 3. Coming back to a series of messages that I started a few weeks back on the nature of Christ's bride, the church, on ecclesiology, and on what Christ's church is, what it is not. The Lord Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, familiar passage, familiar verse, where the Lord Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But because of the rampant apostasy of our day and the false doctrine, the cowardice that we see in the pulpits of America, general irrelevance in a lot of local churches, not dealing with the issues of our day, hiding away from them, basically, and the apparent, what looks to many good Christians as the apparent lack or absence of good, Christ, of good churches, actually, they're standing for biblical truth and the doctrine of the apostles. They're very hard to find, very far between, few and far between. There are many Christians today who grieve because they cannot, in their area, uh, find a good church to join. And they're asking the Lord as I once did, Lord, where is your church? Where is your church? And because of the false notion also that's held by most Christians that the church Jesus said he would build as some kind of a universal, spiritual, unorganized body of believers in Christ. Many Christians have given up on the local church and have actually concluded that as members of Christ's universal body, they don't need the local church and they can just go to the Internet or the Christian TV or whatever for their spiritual fulfillment, uh, where many are actually being fleeced and conned by false prophets, by false Christians and so-called watchmen, watchmen like uh, Rick Wiles, Steve Quayle, Hagman and Hagman, and Tom Horn and others, uh, who are no more than charlatans and wolves drawing sheep after themselves to sell, to sell their wares and their books and to get rich, while other sheep are foolishly getting their stray sheep or foolishly getting their theology from self-appointed YouTube preachers and heretics like the Ruckmanite Brian Dingelinger and other frauds like this one guy from the Palm Beach area calling himself Chaplain Bob Walker who claims on YouTube, on his YouTube channel, that he graduated from Bible college with an earned master's degree, but who, when I questioned him by email, was unable to tell me what Bible college he attended um, or what his alleged master's degree was in. There are hundreds of these types of hucksters and frauds and heretics on YouTube who would never qualify biblically to pastor a church. And so they set up shop on the Internet and they preach against the local church while asking people to send them money, for which these men will one day give an account to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The Bible is very clear in answering the question of where is the Lord's church? The church that Jesus said he would build that would stand in perpetuity against the gates of hell. And the church that Paul said is to be the pillar and ground of the truth. The true church that Jesus built is not a universal spiritual body of all true believers in Christ. The true church that Jesus built is also not a universal earthly organization headed by the Pope of Rome. I'll explain tonight a little bit more while why. Uh, there will be no universal church until we are all gathered together with Christ at the marriage supper of the Lamb. At that time, by the way, there will be a universal church, but that church will never be invisible as we think of the universal church today. It will be quite visible. At that time, we will know even as we are known, and we will see Jesus as he is. Amen. So that's going to be a wonderful day. So in that prospective sense, every believer does have a place in that universal assembly that is to come one day in the heavenly Jerusalem. But until then, there will be no universal church. The true church today is also not found in the apostate 
megachurches that allow themselves to be defined and dictated to by the state or the federal government. The true church that Jesus built has survived and maintained its existence through persecution in every era and every age. And since long before the Protestant Reformation, the true church today is where it has always been among Christ's faithful remnant of nonconformists to refuse to allow, refuse in the first century to allow the Jewish Sanhedrin or later the Roman Empire to license their weekly assemblies together every Lord's Day. He refused then to participate in Constantine's state church or to recognize any central foreign authority over the local church and who through every age were empowered by the Holy Spirit to maintain and contend for the apostolic doctrines once delivered to the saints. I want to quickly review uh, the points covered so far. I'm going to build on them a little bit. The rock that the church was founded on that we just read about in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, as we said, is not the apostle Peter. It is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Number two, the church that Jesus built did not begin at Pentecost. It was founded by the Lord Jesus during his earthly ministry, uh, but it was added to at Pentecost, we read in Acts 2.47. Covered this, this point exclusively in part one of the series. Uh, I'm not going to go back over that ground tonight. The church that Jesus built was and is a local visible assembly composed only of called out believing, regenerated, in other words, truly born again, and scripturally baptized believers that meet together in assembly every Lord's Day for collective prayer, worship, fellowship, training, accountability, and encouragement. The church, singular, uh, that Jesus founded assembled at Jerusalem and then sent disciples out to plant other local churches. As we read in John chapter 20, the church was assembled on the first day of the week, by the way, after the Lord Jesus rose from the dead, when Jesus appeared to the disciples who were still huddled up there in the upper room for fear of the Jews, we read in John chapter 20. When the Bible says that Jesus breathed on them and they received, and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. The church was then assembled exactly a week later, again on the first day of the week, when the Lord appeared to them again, this time Thomas being with them, and this time having no doubts. We see the church assembled again at the Lord's ascension in Acts chapter 1. And then later in the, that same chapter again, they're gathered in the upper room, their first assembly hall, to appoint Matthias as, their, uh, as an apostle in the place of Judas. And then in Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost, the Bible says, had fully come, very important phrase, when the, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, which we know from Leviticus 23.16, means on the morrow after the Sabbath, which was the first day of the week, uh, the Lord's Day, we see the church added to at the, out, at the outpouring of the Holy Ghost on Pentecost. In Acts chapter 6, we see the church collectively appointing deacons as specially qualified men of honest report and full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, who would then manage the church's collections and distribution to the needy, so that the elders could devote themselves instead to prayer and the ministry of the word. And in Acts chapter 8, we see persecution right, raise up against the church. So that we read in chapter 8, verse 4, that the disciples were scattered abroad everywhere preaching the word. Acts 8, 4. Which then caused more local churches to be planted at, at uh, Antioch and elsewhere. And so... Three, then, the, the church Jesus built was a local, visible church that assembled first at Jerusalem, but then sent disciples out to plant other local churches. Nowhere in the New Testament do we find the church being described as universal or Catholic. The so-called Apostles' Creed, that includes that term, where they actually recite, I believe, in the, in the universal or the Catholic church. Uh, that Apostles' Creed, so-called, was in no way authored by the Apostles. It was authored actually centuries later by those that wanted to consolidate central authority over all the local churches in Rome. Nowhere in the New Testament do we read of a universal church that is now 
currently in existence, either visible or spiritual, either one. The word church or churches appears 115 times in 114 verses. <clears throat> 114 verses in the New Testament. In every instance, that word ecclesia means assembly. And in every instance, that word ecclesia is either a reference to a particular congregation meeting at a particular place, or else it's a generic noun uh, that refers to all local churches in general, but still referring to local churches, never to a universal church. As an example of a, of a generic noun, what I'm talking about, for instance, if I preach a message that the husband is to be the authority in the home, I'm not talking about a universal husband or, or a universal home. If I say singular, the husband is to be an authority, the authority in the home. There is no universal Christian home, just as there is no universal Christian church. When I say the husband is to be the authority in the home, I'm using the singular and generic nouns, husband and home, to refer to all Christian husbands and Christian homes in general. So that's the way that word is used many times in the New Testament, and as a generic noun in reference to all churches. Just as Paul sometimes uses the singular term and the generic noun church in the same way, as in Ephesians 1, verse 22, where Paul said, that God the Father had put all things under his feet, under Jesus' feet, and gave him, Jesus, to be head over all things to the church. The church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all and all. This may well be a reference to either the local church there at Ephesus, or it could be a reference, a generic noun reference to all the churches in general. The local church there is or was the instrumentality or the body through which the Lord Jesus accomplished his work at that time in Ephesus until he eventually actually had to remove that church's lampstand as he warned in Revelation 2. I will agree with those who hold the position that we can use the terms the family of God or the kingdom of God uh, to refer to all true believers in Christ in all ages. Those terms, kingdom of God and family of God, uh, may work there, and I fully agree that we do share a kinship and a kindred spirit with every true believer that we meet, whether we're members of the same church or not. But that family of God, which we see, for example, in Ephesians 3, 14, where Paul says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. And that, and that kingdom of God, into which we have all been translated, we read in Colossians chapter 1, and over which the Lord Jesus reigns as king over every believer, is not the church. It's not the same thing. The church is not the kingdom of God, papal doctrine to the contrary, not, notwithstanding. A church is an assembly. A church has to assemble. And there will be no universal assembly of all believers in Christ, again, until we are all assembled with Christ, uh, when he says, uh, we will share the Lord's Supper together with him at that wonderful marriage supper of the Lamb. So the church Jesus built was a local, visible church and continues today, I believe, only as such. So to summarize the reasons given in previous messages as to why I strongly disagree with those that hold to a dual church position, that there are, in other words, there are two churches existing side by side, one local and visible and the other universal and spiritual, which are, in fact, uh, reasons why I hold this position really to be heretical. Um, as stated already, number one, a universal spiritual church cannot assemble. First reason is that a universal spiritual church cannot assemble. In other words, a local visible assembly is demanded by the definition of the Greek word translated church. The word church, ekklesia, means only one thing. It means assembly. And a universal spiritual church cannot assemble. It cannot meet together for collective prayer, worship, or celebration of the Lord's Supper. Uh, we are commanded not to forsake the assembly of ourselves together every Lord's Day, but it is impossible to meet or to assemble with the universal spiritual church. Covered that last time. Number two, I covered briefly, that's what I'm going to go into a little bit more tonight. Number two is that a, a universal spiritual church cannot be the pillar and ground of the truth. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. I want to look at this again. Cover this, as I said briefly last time. I want to expand a little bit. In 1 Timothy 3, verse 1 through 13, we looked at 
uh, Paul lays out the qualifications for elders and deacons in the local church, of course. You can't have elders and deacons in the universal, invisible, spiritual church. And then in verse 14, Paul says this, These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. Verse 15, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou ought to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Well, that phrase, the house of God, which is the church of the living God, may sound to some of the Protestant persuasion uh, like it has to refer to a universal spiritual church. I believe it is undeniable to any honest Bible student who really wants to properly interpret the scriptures that when Paul refers here to the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth, he is talking about Timothy's calling in the local church and how Timothy himself was supposed to guide and lead uh, that church at Ephesus where Paul had asked him to remain for a time to put that church in order and where it appears he was at that time actually serving in a sort of an interim overseer capacity before Paul called him away to other duties and he was to appoint elders and deacons in that church. So Paul here refers to the local church at Ephesus. The local church at Ephesus as the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. He's talking about the local church. Paul also referred to that very church again by the same terms in Acts chapter 20 and speaking probably to those very same elders that Timothy probably appointed uh, at Paul's direction when he met, he called to meet with the, with the Ephesus, excuse me, with the elders from Ephesus, the Ephesian elders, and he said in verse 28 of Acts 20, Take heed therefore into yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost, probably through Timothy, hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now those elders obviously could not feed a universal church, but they were called to feed the church of God at Ephesus, which he had purchased with his own blood. Stating in that one verse, by the way, that Jesus is God, which he hath purchased with his own blood, only Jesus could do that, God the Father didn't do that. That verse also says that the local church is the church of God. Which, by the way, he hath purchased with his own blood. This is Paul described, by the way, also the church at Corinth as the church of God. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1 to 2, says Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, for them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. He used that term quite a bit to refer to local churches, Second Corinthians in introduction, which he says the same thing, other books also. My point is that the local, visible congregation of saints is the church of God. This church that you're sitting in tonight is the church of God in this area. This church where we are assembled today is the very church of God with which he hath, hath purchased with his own blood. So back to 1 Timothy 3, verse 15. Paul says that the local church, the house of God, which is the church of the living God, is also to be the pillar and ground of the truth. And this is perhaps the primary purpose for the church that Jesus built. This is why Jesus founded the church. We read in Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 16. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That's the church, the local church. So we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Why? That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, or by the lie and wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, may grow up unto him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly, the whole body, that's the local body, not the universal body, the whole local body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every, which every joint supply it, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, make an increase of the body the edifying of itself in love. He's talking about how the local body functions there. 
and the purpose for the local body is to be the pillar and ground of the truth. That we can all be taught sound doctrine, so that we will not be blown about by every wind of doctrine. Be no more children tossed to and fro. This is perhaps, I believe, the primary purpose for the church. And a universal spiritual church cannot be the pillar and ground of the, of the truth. It cannot do that. It cannot be any form of a dispensary of doctrine to its members. It cannot produce converts. It cannot teach and disciples converts in any form of unified sound doctrine. Primary function of the church is to preserve and to promulgate the apostolic doctrines of the faith once delivered to the saints, to promote and to produce doctrinal unity and spiritual maturity among its members. But there is no, there can be no doctrinal unity in this universal, invisible spiritual church. There's no unity. It can't be there. I say it last time. The spiritual universal church of so-called uh, Christian TV or of the Internet is the most mixed up, a muddled up source of confusion and false doctrine and apostasy that exists on the planet. There is no unity of doctrine in the so-called universal church. So one of the main reasons that I reject the notion of a universal spiritual church being in existence today is because a universal invisible church cannot be the pillar and ground of the truth. Number three, we talked about last time also, that is that the universal church cannot discipline its members or hold them accountable to the word of God. Again, when you have problems with sending brethren, you can't tell to the church like Jesus said. The universal church can't do that. Talked about that last time. We'll go over that ground again. Number four, then also, uh, church membership, as we talked about last time. As described in the, in the New Testament, Church membership is not possible in that form that we read in the New Testament in the universal spiritual church. In other words, born-again believers cannot contribute their, the use of their spiritual gifts to edify the body as a whole in the universal church. We looked at Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 last time where Paul describes church membership as being an organic, functioning part of a body that is not complete unless every member is doing, uh, actively doing his part in that body. Membership in the church means real flesh and blood members whose active presence is essential to the proper functioning of the church body, all of whom have different spiritual gifts as the Holy Spirit gives to them to fulfill their calling in the local church, and all of whom need that body just as much as the body needs them to be there doing their part, helping to encourage one another. Again, this type of membership is not possible in the universal invisible church. So these things actually are the very essence of the church. It is for these reasons and for these purposes that the Lord Jesus founded his church to meet together for collective worship and prayer, to celebrate the Lord's Supper and fellowship together, to preach the gospel and to win the lost, to baptize converts and train them in sound doctrine, to preserve and to promulgate the apostolic doctrines of the faith once delivered to the saints in order to produce doctrinal unity and spiritual maturity among its members. And also to discipline members that go off into sin with the goal of leading them back to repentance and back into fellowship with the church. These are the purposes for which the Lord Jesus founded his church. And only a local visible assembly can do these things. A universal spiritual body can do none of these things. It has no purpose. It has, it, what can, it can't do anything. And so to me, this is why it is absurd to argue that Christ's church as it exists at this present time is in any way to be a universal spiritual body of all true believers in Christ. So the question is, then, why does it matter? Why am I belaboring this issue? And the reason is because really due to the prevailing apostasy of our day, far too many Christians today have lost a proper understanding of the importance to their own spiritual well-being to be rightly related to a local church. Far too many Christians, or those that call themselves such, are far too willing to forsake the assembling of themselves together with Christ's local church. And it's a great loss not only for them, but for the church, local churches as well. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. I want to look at a few other passages that some say speak of a universal church. Actually, I'm only going to get to one other one tonight. I had planned to go to Hebrews chapter 12. 
And back briefly to 1 Corinthians 12, I won't get there quite yet tonight. But I want to look at Ephesians chapter 5. As I said earlier, that word church or churches appears 115 times in the New Testament. In every instance, that word ecclesia means assembly. And in every instance, the word ecclesia is either a reference to one particular congregation at a particular location, or it's a generic noun that refers to all local churches in general. One of the verses where that word is used in a generic sense, I believe, is here in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 23, which says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Now this is a passage, this is a verse that is often quoted by those holding to the dual church position who argue that the church body in view here is the universal spiritual church. This is one of their favorite passages to cite. But here again, in this verse, we see that not only is that word church used in probably a generic sense to apply to all churches in general or else to the local church at Ephesus, uh, but we also see here the words husband and wife are also used in that sense as well, right here in the same verse, in the generic, as, a, as, a, as generic nouns. No one who would argue from this verse in verse 23 that uh, the, the church in this verse is a universal church would dare argue that there is a universal husband or a universal wife. <laughs> right? Those words are used, obviously, in a generic uh, sense, as generic nouns that apply to all husbands and to all wives. In general, just as that term church is used, and this verse is used in that same way, in a, in a singular, generic sense, with, with application to all churches in general. Why? Because Christ is to be the head over all local, visible churches. Amen. I would add that it is also possible that the word here is used in a literal sense to apply only to the church Paul is addressing here at Ephesus. That's possible. Notice that Paul also uses here the term body in reference to the church. That metaphor, body, is used throughout the New Testament to refer to the church. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. That word body, as it applies to the church, is always used to apply to an organic whole uh, composed of many properly functioning members, each doing their part to edify the body as a unified whole. So it's highly doubtful that such a term would be ever used as a word picture or as a metaphor to describe a, a, a divided, disunified, a universal body that is cut up and spread out over the face of the whole earth. A universal spiritual church cannot exist at this time because it cannot function as a unified organic whole. That word body cannot refer to a universal church because it cannot function as a unified whole. So, Ephesians 5.23, I do believe that word church applies to, the, to uh, the local visible assembly, either to this specific one at Ephesus or to, to all visible assemb local assemblies in general, either in that generic sense or in literal sense, only to the church at Ephesus. We see this very same word used in chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. We read that already where God the Father, it says in verse 22, hath put all things under his feet, Jesus, and gave him, Jesus, to be head over all things to the church, which is, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Again, I believe this is either used in a generic noun sense, referring to all churches, or in the, the singular sense, referring only to the church there at, at Ephesus. And in conclusion tonight, I know I'm cutting it a little bit short tonight, I'm going, to do, I'm going to conclude this and make a little bit of application. Turn to 1 Timothy, back to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Well, actually, we've, we've already been there. But I'm just going to kind of review briefly what we talked about when we were there. Um, because a universal church cannot do the things that the Lord Jesus founded his church to do, and further because the prevailing view of the universal invisible church actually goes against and actually countermands and opposes that very purpose that Jesus set up his church for. Causing or providing actually an excuse for many professing Christians to give up on the local assembly, stay at home on Sunday and to surf the internet or uh, TV instead of getting himself into church where they belong. 
I, I therefore see the universal church doctrine as both destructive and as a dangerous heresy. And that's why I stand opposed to that doctrine. By way of, that's my conclusion. By way of application, I believe that every believer must see as paramount his duty as a Christian to be rightly related to a local assembly of believers. Amen. The local church is to be the pillar and ground of the truth because it is through the local church that we are to be taught the word of God. It is through, the, through Christ's local church that we are to be kept accountable to the word of God and to Christ himself. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5 that to be put out of the local church is to be turned over to Satan himself, which we said last time is a very serious matter. Paul also teaches, I believe in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, that a man who is not in fellowship with the local church, not discerning the Lord's body, as Paul words it, that man cannot be in proper fellowship with Christ himself if he's out of fellowship with the Lord's body, with his local body. So for those Christians who are seeking to know God's will for their lives, you have to start by getting into the center of what you already know to be his will, that means you need to be rightly related to and in fellowship with a local church body. So I want to say if there are any here tonight who may be considering joining this church as members, as a Baptist church that holds strictly to the doctrine of a regenerated church membership, we require that a candidate for membership uh, bring a simple testimony of his conversion before the church to show that he or she is a regenerated born-again believer. A uh, person who, by the way, who need, may need help in doing that can just answer a few simple questions posed by yours truly, but uh, most folks can give a testimony of how you were saved. If that candidate has been already biblically baptized by immersion, uh, we'll accept their personal testimony of that as well. And if the candidate has not already done so, he must then be uh, baptized and will then be approved for membership by the agreement of the church. That's what we do with this church. Now, beyond that, though, we who are already members of Christ's body uh, must have a proper view of that body. And there are possibly some here tonight who I believe do not properly value what we have in this church. As we saw earlier in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, the local visible congregation of saints is the church of God. The church where we are assembled today is the very church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood, the pillar and ground of the truth. As one Baptist preacher writes, Look not, brethren, to some other for the alleged true church. You are in it now. Look around. See it. Glory in it. This assembly was purchased with the blood of Christ. How highly do you value it? The Lord Jesus loves and cares for his church. And that means his local visible assembly. Amen. Which is indeed, actually, a microcosm of what one day will be his glorious bride, finally united and assembled with him in glory. But that day is not yet here. And so for now, the only entity on this earth through which Christ will do his work is his local church. And the internet watchmen and the YouTube preachers that attempt to draw Christians away from the church to follow them instead will one day answer to the Lord Jesus for so doing. In Revelation chapter 1, the Lord Jesus sent letters through the Apostle John to the seven churches of Asia. And we see in that chapter the Lord Jesus walking in the midst of those seven golden candlesticks, which are those seven churches. In his right hand, in the place of high honor, he holds the angels or the spirits of those churches. He will perpetuate his original church he founded through the, through the perpetuation of the daughter churches that were born and descended from that original local assembly. Jesus cares about his church, and he expects us to care for it as well. He has also entrusted his church to us, and he will hold us accountable for what we do with it. I've got three points in closing. Number one is that Christ's church is not to be surrendered. Christ's church is not to be surrendered. Amen. Jesus is the head of his church. We read Ephesians 1 verse 22. God has put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Colossians 1 verse 18 says, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. 
By the way, if Jesus doesn't have preeminence in the local church, he doesn't have preeminence in all things. And in most local churches, so-called, Jesus does not have the preeminence because they're allowing the state to dictate to the church its terms of service, its definition of what it is, etc. In both of these passages, the term church is used in its literal sense to apply to the local churches to whom those letters are written or to local churches in general. And the same is true of every local church of God that he hath purchased with his own blood. It belongs to him. He purchased this church with his own blood. It's his. It belongs to him. It's not to be surrendered to the state or anyone else. The state, in other words, the federal government, the state government, has no say, no say whatsoever in defining what constitutes a true church. I don't care what the IRS definition of a church is. They can't define the church. I don't care what they say. The church belongs to Jesus. That's right. They're trying to re redefine marriage as well. Amen, Brother Jay. The state has no jurisdiction over the church to either dictate to it or to tax it. That's why, by the way, the church is tax immune and needs no tax exemption. The state cannot tax God or his church. This belongs to Jesus. The state has no say in telling the local church how much or of the offerings that its members give to the church, which he had purchased with his own blood, how much that, uh, those offerings can be used by the church and how much, how much must be given to Caesar. The state can't do that. The state has no jurisdiction to tell the church what to do with this offering. The church and everything in it belongs to God. The state has no claim to any part of it. Christ's church is not to be surrendered. This is not something you'll hear in any state church, of course. Uh, we are not to surrender Christ's church to the state, but we are to defend his church, even to the death we have to. Acts 7, 17, verse 7 says, And these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, one Jesus. And that eventually is what led to the Christians being fed to the lions. And we may well one day be fed to the lions ourselves in some sense. Revelation 2, verse 12, the Bible says to the angel of the church in Pergamos, right? These things saith he which hath a sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. That may describe our church one day. We may have persecution coming our way, but we're to be faithful unto death. Christ church is not to be surrendered. Number two, Christ church is not to be despised. Paul says in 1 Timothy 3, verse 15, If I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou ought to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. We're supposed to know how to behave ourselves in the church of God. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 32, Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. By the way, if the church of God was a universal church, how could you offend it? I don't know. I guess by, by sinning, I don't know. But give no offense to the church of God. Talking about the local church. And then Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 20, When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. What, Paul says, how do you not houses to eat and to drink in? He says, or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not. Paul says, do you despise the church to act that way in church? Let's know how you're supposed to behave in the church of the living God. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. So just as it were in Corinth, there may be some here who may need to repent of having a less than loving view of this church who may even despise the church of God which he had purchased with his own blood. In that same context, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 29. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, takes, takes the Lord's Supper unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body, meaning the Lord's local assembly, the Lord's church. And he says, for this cause, many are weak 
and sickly among you, and many sleep. He's talking about being out of fellowship at the local assembly. Christ's church is not to be despised. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Point number three is then Christ's church is not to be forsaken. Uh, both last message on this point also. One more time, let me point out that this passage here in Hebrews chapter 10 occurs in the middle of what is the wherefore clause of the, of the book of Hebrews. Because by one offering, Christ perfected for everything that are sanctified in Hebrews 10 verse 14. And there is now no more need for those Old Testament sacrifices in verse 18. He then says in verse 19, Having therefore, brethren, therefore, this is the, basically the wherefore clause of the whole book, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Down to verse 23, and he says, Therefore, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. We hold fast the profession of our faith by remaining true and faithful to the local assembly, to the church that he hath purchased with his own blood. And then he says, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. The Lord knew that as the day of his approaching draws near, the churches would be attacked more and more by the devil, by the forces of hell, by apostasy, and by heresy, and by greed and worldliness. The Lord knew this day was coming. So therefore, as, this, as the day draws near, and we see the, the more darkness surrounding us, and we see more apostasy, and it becomes more difficult to find a good church, we just have to strive ever more, all the harder, to be faithful to his church. Jesus loves his church, and he expects us to love it as well. Amen? Christ's church is not to be forsaken. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your church. We thank you that you and your wisdom decided to establish your church for the perfecting of the saints, to, to uh, propagate the gospel and the apostolic doctrine delivered to the saints. We thank you, Lord, that you have... Uh, perpetuated your church. We thank you for this church. I pray for those uh, that don't have a church like this to go to. They can't find a local church that proclaims the truth. I pray that you'd help them, Lord, lead them to a church or help them to start a church where they are. Help us all in this church to be faithful to it. Help us, Lord, if anyone here has a, needs an attitude adjustment about our church, I just pray you'd help them to repent and help them to see that. Help us all to desire to be faithful to you through being faithful to your church. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen.